Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Congress of the United States begun and held at the City of New York on Wednesday, the 4th of March, 1789. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers, that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends to its institution. Resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America, in Congress assembled, two-thirds of both houses concurring, that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of the several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States, all or any of which articles, when ratified by three-fourths of the said legislatures, to be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the said Constitution. Hello, and welcome to episode 262 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. If we want to understand American law, we need to understand history. History is what the justices of the United States Supreme Court use whenever they need to ascertain the framer's intent. It's the tool the justices use to find answers to. What did the founders mean when they drafted certain passages of the Constitution of 1787? Or what did the framers mean when they created the Constitution's first 10 amendments? History helps judges and justices determine how to adapt the Constitution to meet the needs and circumstances of our modern time. So how and why has the Supreme Court's adaptation of the United States Constitution and its interpretation of its amendments changed over time? And how has the court used history to shape the laws around us? We can see answers to these questions when we take a closer look at the Fourth Amendment. Sarah Seo is an associate professor of law at the University of Iowa. She's an expert on the Fourth Amendment who has likewise wanted to know how and why the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment has changed over time, and how that change has impacted the way the Fourth Amendment can protect us from unreasonable searches and seizures. So, as we investigate answers to these questions, of how and why the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment has changed over time, and how that change has impacted American society, Sarah reveals information about history and the law and how lawyers are taught to use history in their practice of the law. Originalism and living constitutionalism, two methods of constitutional interpretation, and the history and evolution of Fourth Amendment interpretation and what that history and evolution reveals to us about the importance of the Fourth Amendment in our 21st century. And now, our fourth Doing History series concludes with an investigation of the Fourth Amendment and its interpretation over time. Articles in addition to an amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Amendment 3. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in time of war, but in a matter to be prescribed by law. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Our guest is an associate professor of law at the University of Iowa, where she teaches both criminal procedure and legal history. She's the author of numerous articles and a book, Policing the Open Road, How Cars Transformed 
American freedom. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Sarah Seo. Hi, thank you for having me on this podcast. So Sarah, you teach both criminal procedure and legal history at the University of Iowa Law School. And I wonder, could you tell us a bit about your work as a law professor and if and how the subject of history ever comes up in your teaching of the law? Sure. So I teach criminal procedure investigations and adjudication, which covers the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments. And I teach future lawyers, not future historians, which shapes how I incorporate history into teaching in a law school. So instead of teaching, for example, all of the relevant literature on U.S. history in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, I use history to teach my students about how we got the laws that we got, for example. I use history to give them the context for judicial decisions to try to understand why humans in the past decided cases the way they did. And I use history to give a broader perspective of laws in American society. And so all of that context helps students to understand better the current laws that we have today. So in some ways, the ways that law professors teach history in law school really isn't all that different from how historians teach history in college and university classrooms. And that like law professors, historians really want to provide context. They want to explain how and why events happened as they did, how and why people acted as they did, and really to show how and why human societies have changed over time. So both law professors and historians really want to just show context. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. And one other thing that I would want to mention is that history is also a methodology. It's a way of telling stories or narratives about our past and how we got from that past to our present. Another way to think about telling historical narratives, it's a story of cause and effect, right? Why did such and such happen? And at this particular time, and why did these particular people act in the way they did? And to tell a story about explaining how we got from point A to point B, what historians do is they emphasize certain facts and omit facts that they don't think are as important. And that's the skill that lawyers use all the time when they're making persuasive legal arguments. And so that historical skill is something that I see as very much akin to what lawyers do, the lawyering skills. And so I bring that in as well. I guess that explains why so many lawyers tend to be history majors before they go on to law school. Exactly. A history major is a great preparation for law school. Now, in earlier episodes of this Doing History series, we've spoken with other scholars who have told us about the law and how we preserve the law. So in episode 259, Jesse Kratz, the National Archives historian, told us all about the physical preservation of the law when she told us how the National Archives preserves the physical documents of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And in episode 260, Kenneth Bowling told us how historians preserve the documentary record that really shows us a lot about how the Constitution and Bill of Rights came to be drafted, ratified, and adopted by the United States. So Sarah, I wonder if as a lawyer, you could tell us about a third way that we preserve the law, which is through interpretation. Would you tell us how historians and lawyers interpret the ideas contained within documents like the Constitution and Bill of Rights? This is a really interesting question. I think one role that historians have traditionally is remembrance, right? Remembering the past. And one thing that uh, professional historians or academic historians do is we're always constantly looking for sources, new sources, or we're rereading sources to see what new things we can learn with fresh eyes. And so we're always trying to have a better understanding of our past. And that remembrance, I think, is one way of preserving the law. The other thing that I wanted to say here is that the law, when we're getting away from textual sources and what's written on paper, the law is contested, right? That's why we have litigation. We have competing constitutional claims because People think that what the law is, is different from what other people may think what the law is, and that it constantly has to be negotiated, decided, and resolved. So in that process of contesting what the law is, I think is another way that we preserve the law. And I think it's interesting that in 
our legal system, precedent is so important. And another way to think about precedent is history. We're always constantly referring to how we've done things in the past to help us decide what we should be doing in the future and deciding cases in the present. And so those are all ways that historians and lawyers preserve the past. It seems like there are differences in the ways that lawyers approach their study and interpretation of laws and documents like the Bill of Rights and the ways that historians approach their study and interpretation of laws and documents like the Bill of Rights. So would you highlight some of the differences in approach to studying and interpreting laws and documents for us? Sure. Let me take a stab at that really complex question. And I say it's complex because there's such a diversity of lawyers and how they use history. There's an incredible diversity among historians and how they approach the study of the past and what methodologies they use. So not every historian is similar, not every lawyer is similar. So that's one reason why the question you've asked is complicated. But in broad general terms, lawyers and historians use history in somewhat different ways, right? Lawyers want to achieve a certain outcome and they want to show that history supports the position that they're staking. And the way that historians use or think about law in the past is they see law as one source among many sources to get an understanding of how people in the past lived. And so the questions that lawyers ask versus the questions that historians ask are a little bit different. So lawyers might ask, how does history inform how we should interpret the Fourth Amendment, for example? Whereas historians would ask, There's a lot of Fourth Amendment cases that exploded in the 1920s and 30s. Why? What does that tell us about American society and culture at that time? There also seem to be two big ideas or schools of thought, if you will, when it comes to constitutional interpretation among lawyers. Now, the first method of interpretation uses this idea of a living constitution. It's a method that we might also know as classic constitutionalism. While the second method of interpretation really relies on this philosophy of originalism. So Sarah, would you tell us about these two schools of thought and how these schools of thought impact how lawyers, judges, and legal scholars might interpret the Constitution or a constitutional law like the Fourth Amendment? I'm glad you followed up with this question because it goes back to what I was saying earlier about there's a diversity among lawyers and how they think about history and the law. And I think this question that you're asking now is one aspect of that diversity. So let me just quickly define in broad terms what originalism and leaving constitutionalism are. So originalism goes to the idea that the meaning of the words in the Constitution are fixed, that there was a meaning that the people who drafted the Constitution had. And that meaning, first of all, it doesn't change over time. And second, that that meaning is binding on judges who interpret the Constitution. So that's originalism. Living constitutionalism is the view that what the Constitution means and constitutional doctrines should change in response to changing circumstances, changing values, and to reflect a modern society, basically. And so those are the two main approaches that we have today of how to interpret the Constitution So how do these ideas play out when they face each other in a court of law? And I ask because from the definitions you just gave, it really seems like living constitutionalism and originalism are at loggerheads with each other because you have living constitutionalism, which says that context matters and we can adapt the Constitution and its amendments to our own present time, while originalism says that there is no change over time. The meaning in the Constitution is the meaning and everything is fixed. So what happens when these two ideas meet in a courtroom? Could you give us an example of how these different arguments might play out? Sure, I can give you an example of that. And it's an example that comes from my book, which is about the history of the Fourth Amendment in the 20th century. So to give background, the Fourth Amendment secures the right of the people in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. 
And it also articulates what the warrant requirement is. It says no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause and supported by oath or affirmation. And it goes on to give other requirements for warrants. Now, what happened in the 1920s was there was an explosion of Fourth Amendment cases. And when I read through all these cases, I realized a lot of them were coming up in the context of prohibition. So prohibition was ratified in 1919 and enacted in 1920, which prohibited liquor throughout the country. This was also the first decade of the mass production of cars. And so bootleggers were realizing that they could transport illegal liquor in their cars. And police officers were trying to pursue getaway cars in search for illegal liquor. And so this conflict produced a lot of Fourth Amendment litigation. And so the precise issue was, do police officers need a warrant to stop and search a car based on their suspicion that there's liquor inside? And so to ask this question, what judges first did was, what is a car? A car is an effect that's listed under the Fourth Amendment. An effect, we don't use that word a lot anymore these days, but effect is basically any movable good or property. And so judges who were, if we can characterize them as originalists, although they didn't exactly exist in the 1920s, judges who looked to the Constitution in a very textual way said cars are effects. Therefore, the Fourth Amendment requires that police officers get a warrant to stop and search a car. So that would be kind of the way that an originalist today would interpret the Fourth Amendment as applied to cars. And that's actually the way Justice Scalia interprets the Fourth Amendment as it applies to cars. Versus the living constitutionalism approach would say, you know what, cars are a new technology that has completely changed American society. Chief Justice Taft at the time called it the greatest instrumentality for the commission of crimes. It completely changed how people committed crime. It completely changed how law enforcement could pursue suspected criminals. And so to allow law enforcement to actually be able to enforce prohibition, the warrant requirement got in the way, right? There's no time to go to a magistrate judge to swear out a warrant and then go chase the car. The car's already off. And so The living constitutionalism approach to this question is, well, cars are new. It presents a new problem in society. And so Fourth Amendment warrant requirements shouldn't be applied to cars. And that's basically what the Taft court did in 1925. They said automobiles would not require warrants under the Fourth Amendment. So this raises a larger question because, as you mentioned, cars were a big deal in the 20th century. They were a big technological innovation. And here we have this Fourth Amendment, which was drafted in 1789 and ratified in 1791. And during the 1920s, we really see the Supreme Court trying to use this late 18th century amendment to regulate a very 20th century technological effect. And when we think about today, we live in the 21st century where we have even more technological effects, right? We have cloud data, smart speakers, GPS devices, smartphones. I know I'm forgetting a whole lot here, but We have a lot of technological innovation. So how do you think we can reconcile our use of laws and documents that were drafted in the late 18th century to solve our very 21st century problems? That's the hardest question that judges and lawyers face in the 20th century and that we continue to face today, which is why Fourth Amendment cases exploded in the 20th century. So to give you a little bit of historical context, You're right, the Bill of Rights, which included the Fourth Amendment, were ratified in the 18th century. When I started this research on the history of Fourth Amendments, I started by reading all the Fourth Amendment cases from the 18th century. And there were a few, some years, no Fourth Amendment cases in state or federal courts. A few more popped up towards the end of the 18th century, but really it exploded hundreds of Fourth Amendment cases in the 1920s. And so the mass production of cars, the new technology at the time, was raising all sorts of questions about how to adapt this 18th century document for a modern era. And Fourth Amendment cases have only increased since the 1920s, so we're still grappling with them. And you're right, uh, new technologies like smartphones, 
GPS tracking devices are continuing to puzzle and frustrate the Supreme Court today. So that's not really an answer to your question. Basically, my answer to your question is it's a really hard question that we haven't settled on an answer to yet. Now, what about change over time? How have Americans answered this question about how they should apply the Fourth Amendment to their own time? Could you tell us about any 19th century examples where judges and justices were trying to reconcile this very 18th century Fourth Amendment to their new 19th century? In the 19th century, you know, there's one famous case from the 19th century, Boyd versus United States. In that case involved a forfeiture proceeding for the non-payment of taxes. And so what the prosecutor wanted was a subpoena to order Boyd, the defendant, to produce an invoice that might prove his guilt. This was the first significant interpretation of the Fourth Amendment by the Supreme Court in 1886, so almost a century after (laughs) the ratification of the Fourth Amendment. And what the court said there was that business papers counted as papers under the Fourth Amendment, and so the government couldn't force Boyd to hand over his commercial or business documents as evidence against himself. This is called the mere evidence rule. It distinguishes mere evidence from the contraband, the illegal document or an instrumentality or fruit of the crime. And that makes it really hard, if you think about it, to prosecute somebody. If a prosecutor can only request evidence that's actually a fruit of the crime rather than evidence of the crime. And that doctrine has been undermined pretty quickly uh, within a few decades of the Boyd case. But we see over since the Boyd case in 1886, through the 20th century, that the court has really changed the meaning of the Fourth Amendment from its original context. So in the 18th century, when the founders drafted the Fourth Amendment, they were thinking back to their experience with the British monarchy. They were thinking about what led to the American Revolution. And we all remember the Tea Party, American colonialists, protested against taxes without representation by throwing all the tea into the ocean. And because a lot of American colonialists didn't want to pay their taxes, what Parliament did was to enact a general warrant that allowed customs officials to essentially search any place and anybody to see if they were not paying their taxes. And this is the experience that the founders had in mind when they drafted the Fourth Amendment. What's the Fourth Amendment that we have today? The Fourth Amendment cases that the court's deciding almost once or twice a year aren't about legislative general warrants passed to allow law enforcement to search anybody or anywhere, right? The Fourth Amendment today is concerned with police officers searching and seizing things without a specific warrant, not a general warrant. So the meaning and the application of the Fourth Amendment's changed quite a bit over the past few centuries. Now, what happened after the Supreme Court issued the Boyd decision in 1886? How did the Boyd decision impact new and further interpretations of the Fourth Amendment later in the 20th century? The way that I would answer this question is to first look at what's going on in American society. From the late 19th century to the early 20th century, we see the emergence of an administrative state where the state is becoming more and more involved in regulating businesses for public safety and welfare, labor regulations, factory regulations. So all of this is happening during this time. And so the next major Supreme Court case comes up in 1914. This is Weeks versus United States. The particular case involved a lottery. So part of the modern state's interest was to what we today call morals regulation. Progressives back then thought Morals legislations were necessary to promote people's welfare and well-being. So they prohibited lottery uh, tickets. They also prohibited liquor. Prohibition is an example of a progressive era morals legislation. So Weeks versus United States is a lottery case. I think the police went into an apartment or someone's home to search for evidence of lottery ticketing. And so what the Supreme Court did in that case was to say this was an illegal search because there was no warrant. And the remedy for this unconstitutional act was to exclude the evidence from the prosecution. 
And so the implications of that is if there's no evidence of a lottery offense, then the defendant goes free. So this was a way to deter unconstitutional acts by law enforcement, because if they can't use the evidence, then their work is dead-ended anyway. And we call that the exclusionary rule. So that was the first major doctrinal move. And that was in 1914, more than a century after the ratification of the Fourth Amendment. We've now talked about a couple of really big Supreme Court Fourth Amendment cases in the 19th and 20th centuries, but it occurs to me that we really haven't talked about the Supreme Court. So earlier we discussed how lawyers and judges can view constitutional interpretation through the ideas of living constitutionalism and originalism, and that lawyers and judges will use these interpretive philosophies to achieve a specific end. But it does seem like the Supreme Court may use these different interpretive philosophies a bit differently from your everyday lawyer and courtroom judge. So could you tell us about the Supreme Court and the role it plays in interpreting and applying the Constitution and its amendments to our present time? Sure. So the Supreme Court's jurisdiction includes a lot of things, but for the purposes of this conversation, they also are the last court to decide interpretations of the Constitution. And so what they say about the decisions they make about what the Fourth Amendment means has to be followed by the courts of appeals as well as the district courts. So they play a really important role in defining what the Constitution means. Now, you also mentioned that with the Fourth Amendment today, it's not really about general warrants as the Fourth Amendment expressed in 1789, but that the Fourth Amendment has really become about police behavior when conducting searches. And this was a change that we could really start to see in the Boyd and Weeks cases that you described. So I wonder, what does this trajectory and understanding of the Fourth Amendment mean for interpretations of the Fourth Amendment today? And by that, I mean, what kinds of everyday situations might we find ourselves in where the Fourth Amendment can really be of service to us? So this is the reason why I wrote my book on the history of the Fourth Amendment in the 20th century as a history about policing cars. So what cars did was, first of all, because they were mass produced and they were readily available for a wide range of individuals to purchase and own, a lot of people drove and rode in cars. And because cars posed a lot of danger on public roads in terms of accidents and also in terms of managing and directing traffic, cities and towns throughout the United States increased their police forces to essentially direct traffic and manage all the car accidents and fatalities. And a large part of that job was to enforce the traffic laws. And so the traffic stop throughout the 20th century was the most common police citizen encounter for just the ordinary American. Today, a lot of people can say, yeah, I've been pulled over, ticketed. A lot of people have a story about how they've been pulled over, right? That observation was made as early as the 1930s, where people were commenting the most salient encounter for this citizen in terms of their relationship with the state is that traffic stop where they're encountering the police agent. And so at that moment, when an officer stops you in a car, it's essentially a seizure, right? And the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. And so the Fourth Amendment comes in right away when citizen drivers are pulled over. And I would say that's still probably the most common encounter that ordinary people have today with the police and encounter the Fourth Amendment in that context. Fourth Amendment cases don't seem to be going away. In fact, we're seeing more and more Fourth Amendment cases come before the Supreme Court. For example, on November 4, 2019, the Supreme Court will reconsider interpretations of the Fourth Amendment when it hears the case Kansas v. Glover. Sarah, would you tell us about Kansas v. Glover and about the Fourth Amendment issue the parties in this case want the court to decide upon and reconcile? This case is fascinating to me. So just to explain what this case involves, the police officer in this case did a registration check on a license plate. So if anybody's ever gone on a ride along, a lot of police cars today have basically a computer inside right next to the wheel 
And officers can type in license plate numbers on that computer screen. And that will pull up a database about whether the owner whose name is registered to that license plate number, whether there's an outstanding warrant, arrest warrant for that registered driver, whether their license is revoked or not. It pulls up a host of information. And so what this officer did was he must have been suspicious about this car in some way. He did a registration check on the license plate, and it showed that the registered owner of the car had a revoked driver's license. And so he decided to pull over the car to check. And indeed, it was Glover who had the registration and the revoked driver's license, and he was arrested and charged with driving with a revoked license. Now, the problem is that the officer, before he pulled over Glover and checked, did not know with probable cause that it was Glover who was driving the car at that moment. Because a lot of times people let somebody else borrow their car, right? They let their spouse borrow their car, they let a friend borrow their car, or their child to borrow their car. So the officer didn't know with probable cause that it was actually the person who was driving that car was driving with a revoked driver's license. And the state argued that even though they didn't have probable cause, they had reasonable suspicion to stop the car. And so the issue before the Supreme Court is whether this amounts to reasonable suspicion that justifies an officer to pull over a car to check to see if it's the driver who's driving the car has the revoked driver's license. This would seem to be a simple case in that there's certainly a good likelihood that the person driving the car is the person who owns and registered the car, right? The difficulty of this case, I think, is because of the larger social context where a lot of people drive. We're seeing more news stories about a lot of poor Americans and also minority Americans have outstanding warrants for minor traffic violations or traffic tickets that they were unable to pay. In a lot of jurisdictions, it's really easy to have an outstanding arrest warrant for failure to pay a traffic ticket. A lot of poor and minority drivers, as a result, have revoked driver's licenses. And so the greater social concern with this case is, will this further enable racialized profiling on the road where it's easy to pull over a driver on the basis of race without any other suspicion other than that? So it's one of those really difficult cases where the legal issues seem simple, but the greater social issues and the social context make it a really hard decision. Wow. It does sound like Kansas v. Glover is a really involved case. Why do you think it's a case that we should pay attention to? How might cases like Kansas v. Glover that put Fourth Amendment interpretations to the test really impact our lives and our civil liberties? Yeah, so this question is really important, and it goes back to the discussion that we had earlier about living constitutionalism and originalism. We talked about how those two can be at loggerheads, but not always. I think both principles strive to uphold the original spirit of the drafters and what their intended purposes were. So as applied to this case, Kansas v. Grover, one way to look at it is we've come a really long way from what the Fourth Amendment meant in the 18th century, where an officer who suspects that somebody's driving with a revoked driver's license can pull over a driver. And the other issues that some lawyers and civil rights activists are thinking about is once a driver is pulled over, it's really easy for a police officer to start gathering facts that support probable cause that there might be something more inside the car, that something more being drugs. And once they have enough facts to support probable cause that there might be drugs, the Fourth Amendment now allows them to start searching the car without a warrant. And it's no coincidence that a lot of Fourth Amendment cases involve a minority driver who was first pulled over for a minor traffic violation, but then charged with a drug conviction. So those are the greater concerns that we have. But then if we think about what the founders were concerned with when they ratified the Fourth Amendment, they were concerned with general warrants, right? What were general warrants? There were basically laws that enabled law enforcement or an executive officer to stop and search anybody without justified cause. 
there's an analogy for that today, and that's traffic laws. Traffic laws act as a general warrant, essentially. Think about how almost everybody, when they get behind the wheel, at some point violates some traffic law, right? We all speed at least once when we get behind the wheel. We might have forgotten to turn on the signal when we uh, switch lanes. A lot of the Fourth Amendment cases that I read and teach begin with a busted taillight or some other minor traffic violation. We're all guilty of that. But according to the court's Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, a minor traffic violation gives sufficient legal cause for a police officer to stop a car. So in that sense, when we have traffic laws that everybody violates at some point, and a violation of a traffic law gives sufficient cost for a police officer to stop a car, that starts looking like a general warrant that the founders had in mind when they wrote the Fourth Amendment. And so we can look to the past, we can look to history and look for analogies in the analogous ways that the state exercises their power and analogous ways that the Fourth Amendment can speak to modern experiences. And so I think that's one reason why it's really important to look to the history. Speaking of analogies, we can't know how the Supreme Court will decide Kansas v. Glover, but I wonder if we can guess or get an idea of how the justices might use history to think through this case if we look at their more recent Fourth Amendment rulings. Now, the 18th century origins of the Bill of Rights and Constitution still seem to be really important to the ways that lawyers and judges interpret the law. In fact, justices of the Supreme Court have cited 18th century precedents and language in their 21st century decisions. And we heard about this earlier. Sarah mentioned that Justice Antonin Scalia was known for citing 18th century cases, and he did this as late as 2012 in United States v. Jones, where Justice Scalia issued a majority opinion that cited the 1765 English case of Entick v. Carrington as precedent. So Sarah, could you tell us about United States v. Jones and why in this 21st century case Justice Scalia referenced an English case from 1765? Sure. So the Entick case is where agents of the monarchy, I believe, went to the home of suspected seditionists for evidence of sedition. And I believe there was a warrant in that case, but it was given by an executive official, not a judicial officer. And so the case stands for the proposition that a warrant must be executed according to established legal means, and be justified before a neutral judge, not somebody who's interested in the prosecution of the case. And Justice Scalia cites that old case in his opinion in United States versus Jones, which was decided in 2012. And the Jones case was a drug investigation, and the police had a suspect that they were investigating for some time, And as part of that investigation, they attached a GPS tracking device to his Jeep Grand Cherokee. And so the question before the court was whether attaching a GPS tracking device to a car was a search, as the Fourth Amendment understands it to be. So a search under the Fourth Amendment is not defined in the way that a dictionary defines a search. A search under the Fourth Amendment has a different definition. The definition that the court had been using was whether it violated a reasonable expectation of privacy. And so what Scalia wanted to do in the Jones case, because he was an originalist, was he wanted to get back to the original understanding of what a search was. And he didn't think the reasonable expectation of privacy standard was originalist. Is actually the court came up with it in a 1965 case. And that's not original enough for him. So he cites this English 1765 case for the proposition that what the officers in that case did was they invaded a home, a private property. And so likewise, he argued in the Jones case that a car is private property. It's an effect, which is listed in the Fourth Amendment. And so if you intrude on private property and attaching a GPS device to the car was intruding on private property or trespassing on private property, that was a search under the Fourth Amendment. And so then the court had to figure out whether a warrant would be required or not. But it came to kind of a comedic tit-for-tat between Justices Scalia and Alito in that case. 
because Scalia declared that there was no doubt that this would have been considered a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment when it was adopted. But Alito comes back and says, what would be the 18th century analogy to attaching a GPS device to a car? And he imagines, well, if this had occurred in 1791, it would have either required a gigantic coach or a very tiny constable who could follow the coach around like a GPS tracking device, or both, not to mention a constable with incredible fortitude and patience that could follow the carriage for two weeks was, I think, the duration in the United States versus Jones. So you see the tension here where Scalia wants to go back and try to find analogies to the 18th century, a car's private property. And Alito pointing out, you know, those analogies can be ridiculous when you think about it. I would also add that I disagree with Scalia on this point in the sense that it's beyond dispute that a car is an effect as that term is used in the Fourth Amendment. For that proposition, he cites just one case dating to 1977. And when you look at that case, it doesn't cite anything for that proposition that a car is an effect. And actually, that case goes on to say that there are differences between cars and other property. And what I show my book after reading a lot of 20th century Fourth Amendment cases is that cars have been, throughout the 20th century, treated very differently from other private properties. And this was something that courts wrestled with throughout the 20th century. And it's still something that courts wrestle with today, as we saw between Justice Scalia and Alito in the Jones case. On the one hand, a car is private property, right? The driver purchases it, owns it, registers it. But on the other hand, judges were recognizing that cars were also like public property in the sense that the government heavily regulated the use of cars. Even though individuals privately own their cars, they can't use their cars unless they get permission from the state. And that permission takes the form of a driver's license. One cannot drive without a driver's license or permission from the state. And cars are driven on public roads and highways. And they're subject to a lot of regulation, the, the entire traffic code. And so in those ways, courts had said throughout the 20th century, cars are actually more like public property than private property. And that's precisely the reason courts have given for not requiring a warrant to stop and search a car. So in that sense, Scalia overlooked an entire century's worth of Fourth Amendment cases to say a car is obviously an effect under the Fourth Amendment. Could it be that Scalia overlooked a century's worth of Fourth Amendment cases because, as you mentioned earlier, lawyers really want to use history to make a point and they really want the past to be behind them when they make that point? And here you have that 1765 case, Entick v. Carrington, and that seems to be what put history behind Scalia's point in his majority opinion. Yes. He wouldn't care about all the 20th century cases. He would look to uh, 18th century and actually in a different case. And in another car case, Arizona versus Gantt, Justice Scalia asked during oral argument, you know, what was the situation <laughs> when the Fourth Amendment was adopted? If an officer stopped Thomas Jefferson's carriage to arrest Thomas Jefferson and the officer pulled him off to the side of the road, could an officer search the carriage? So he didn't care about what happened in the 20th century. He wanted to go back to understand what happened in the 18th century. The problem is, you know, realistically, Thomas Jefferson wasn't stopped in his carriage for lots of reasons. One is that modern police officers that proactively investigated crime, they didn't really exist in the 18th century. That was, a, as I argue in my book, a 20th century development because of cars. And the other thing is, I don't think that people of standing like Thomas Jefferson would have been stopped in his carriage, like a lot of drivers are today. And so the question about, you know, what would have happened to Thomas Jefferson? What would have happened to somebody who was in a carriage in the 18th century? Only rich people had carriages in the 18th century, and they weren't going to be stopped by any law officer at the time. And so it's a question that would have never come to be. And so trying to look at 18th century practices, I don't think is as helpful when we're trying to apply an 18th century document and its text to the 21st century. And I think looking at the principles underlying the text can be helpful, though. It's really understanding the uses and the limits, the potential and the limits of history.
Speaking of the potential uses and limits of history, was Justice Scalia unique in his citation of such an early precedent, or do lawyers, judges, and Supreme Court justices regularly reference 18th century law in their arguments and cases? It's not unusual. I would say that no matter the justices and any good lawyer, I think, today would try to make the originalist and or textualist argument. I think that it's a good place to start and a good lawyer start there. And the problem is that a lot of words are vague and they are open to interpretation. And so that's when the helpfulness of originalism and 18th century history might be limited when we have open textured phrases and words, like the meaning of a search or the meaning of a house or the meaning of papers, right? Papers today, I for one have largely gone over to electronic where I try to keep as few papers as possible and I keep everything on my computer in the clouds, right? So do papers cover that? Do papers cover like the Boyd case that we talked about in 1886? Do papers cover business papers and invoices? And so those things all have to be interpreted. And looking to the 18th century, when they didn't have Facebook, when they didn't have the internet, when they didn't have cars, those are the limits to 18th century history. But I think we can still look to the principles for sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you why you think it might be helpful for us to understand early American history if we really want to understand American law and how it operates today. So what do you think about this issue? Understanding the context of how the Fourth Amendment came to be can teach us why the Fourth Amendment is important, even today. The drafters were really concerned with the arbitrary power of executive officers or the state prying into our private lives to look for evidence and to pass and to prosecute. And that concern still is a concern today. And so understanding the context of how the Fourth Amendment right came to be counted among First Ten Amendments in the Bill of Rights is important. But also, I really do believe that understanding how the Fourth Amendment changed since then is important to understanding what we have today. Understanding why judges in the 20th century expanded the Fourth Amendment to allow the police to be able to stop and search cars and how that evolved throughout the 20th century to cases like, and these cases are really common where you have joint task forces between state, local, and federal agents driving or cruising around neighborhoods that they consider to be dangerous or high crime areas and stopping next to cars based on a suspicion that they might be in violation of a parking regulation and ordering passengers out and then seeing weapons, which leads to a search, which leads to finding drugs. Immense state power began with a suspected parking violation. How do we get here? And looking through the 20th century history of the Fourth Amendment, we see how judges validly wanted to allow the police to be able to go after cars. It was just this really new and dangerous technology. And to do that, they said, well, we'll allow it if it's reasonable. And to see how courts decided what is reasonable policing and what is not reasonable policing gives us a sense of maybe we've come too far and maybe it's time to go back to some of the 18th century principles. And so history does inform that development and also puts it into context, right? The Fourth Amendment is contested in American society, and it interacts with other political and social issues like the war on drugs, racial profiling, racial discrimination, and the way that minor traffic tickets and citations mire poor citizens in debt that spiral into outstanding arrest warrants. All of that, all the context that history brings in is important to understand where we might want to go in the future with our Fourth Amendment. And speaking of the Fourth Amendment, Sarah, you're a Fourth Amendment expert, so we'd love to know, is there something about the Fourth Amendment that you really wish more people knew about? Yeah, I do. There's actually a conventional narrative of the Fourth Amendment, that the Fourth Amendment evolved throughout the 20th century to give individuals more rights. And this is a story that's told 
primarily through landmark Supreme Court cases, Weeks versus the United States from 1914 that we discussed earlier that established the exclusionary rule as one of those landmark cases. Another landmark case is Wolf versus Colorado in 1949 where the Supreme Court said that the Fourth Amendment also applies to states. Another landmark case is Matt versus Ohio in 1961, where the court said not only does the Fourth Amendment apply to the states, but also the exclusionary rule applies to the states. And so we have this kind of triumphal narrative that the court developed the Fourth Amendment in the 20th century to give individuals more rights. But when you look at those cases, those cases are instances where The government invaded a home without a warrant. Those are home invasion cases. And in those cases, the court acted boldly to develop and evolve the Fourth Amendment. What I do in my book is to show that there's actually hundreds of thousands of more cases on the Fourth Amendment that aren't about homes. They're about cars. And if we look at the Fourth Amendment cases that are about car stops and car searches, what courts do is they actually allow a lot of police discretionary authority to the point where we really have very little privacy rights in our cars today. And that's the story of the Fourth Amendment that I want people to understand. And I think it's an important story because, like I mentioned earlier, most people encounter the police not in their homes, but they encounter the police in their cars. And so this was an encounter that Americans throughout the 20th century thought about when they thought about what should be the limits of the police in a democratic society. They weren't only thinking about their homes, they were also thinking about their cars, which in American culture was celebrated to be their freedom machines, ironically. So that's the part of the history that I would encourage people to read more about. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor shall private property be taken for public use without compensation. Amendment 6. In all criminal persecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The hardest question facing lawyers and judges today is the question of how do we apply 18th century law, that is, the constitutional law that comes to us from the Constitution of 1787 and the Bill of Rights Amendments of 1789, how do we apply those 18th century laws to our 21st century situations? As we heard from Sarah, no one has an exact answer on this, which is why the number of Fourth Amendment cases skyrocketed during the 1920s and why so many Fourth Amendment cases still come before the Supreme Court today. Technology really complicates our understanding of the Fourth Amendment, because we have so many new technologies that simply didn't exist in the 18th century. We have smartphones, cloud data accounts, GPS tracking devices, and smart speakers, just to name a few pieces of present-day tech. So when we read the Fourth Amendment today, we really have to ask ourselves, does the Fourth Amendment protect our data on these devices from unreasonable searches and seizures? And If the Fourth Amendment does protect our data, how does it protect our data? Plus, these aren't the only pressing questions facing American law when it comes to the Fourth Amendment. For example, in November 2019, lawyers will argue the case of Kansas v. Glover before the Supreme Court. This case asks the court a seemingly simple question. Can police officers use registration checks as the reasonable suspicion they need to stop a car, even when they aren't 100% certain that the car's registered owner is the car's driver. And yet, this seemingly simple question isn't so simple. As Sarah noted, this case points to a much larger social issue. And that larger social issue is, if a registration check can provide police with the reasonable suspicion they need to conduct a traffic stop, will this enhance their ability to conduct racial profiling? 
How the court might decide on this issue is hard to say. The Supreme Court has really changed its interpretation of the Fourth Amendment over time. For example, when the framers created the Fourth Amendment, they were thinking about the American Revolution and the Crown's general warrants. These warrants allowed Crown officials to search whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and wherever they wanted. But by the 19th century, the situation and context had changed. Americans now lived in a growing administrative state. The federal government became more and more involved in regulating businesses for public safety. And we can see that from 1886 to the present, the Supreme Court and American people really considered this new context as they grappled with this important question. How do we apply 18th century law to 19th and 20th century problems? As Sarah expressed, throughout the 20th century, the Supreme Court answered this question in two ways. First, through home invasion cases. And second, through car cases. Okay, so home invasion cases. In the 1914 case, Weeks v. United States, the Supreme Court ruled that if federal agents invade your home without a proper warrant and seize evidence against you during that invasion, well, the agents can't then use that evidence against you in court. This became known as the exclusionary rule. And throughout the 20th century, the Supreme Court continued to expand on its interpretation of the Fourth Amendment, even going so far as to tell the individual states that they had to abide by the exclusionary rule too. And yet, the Supreme Court's expansive interpretation of the Fourth Amendment seems only to have applied to home invasion cases. When we look at the interpretive history of the Fourth Amendment through cars, we see a very different interpretation. The Fourth Amendment's relationship with cars began during Prohibition. Many Americans were not at all pleased when the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution banned the use and possession of alcohol within the United States. So many took to skirting this new constitutional law by using their automobiles to find and transport alcohol. But what is an automobile? Is it a personal effect as described by the Fourth Amendment? And if it is, does a police officer really need to fulfill the obligations of the Fourth Amendment's warrant clause to stop and search a car? These were questions the American people and the Supreme Court grappled with during the 1920s and 30s. And as Sarah revealed, we're still working out answers to these questions. Over time, there have been thousands of cases that have led to the collective determination that, yes, cars are private effects. But no, they can't be protected under the Fourth Amendment like our houses and papers because cars let us drive away and evade the police immediately. Essentially, if the Fourth Amendment applied to cars as written, the police would rarely catch any wrongdoers because they'd see something suspicious and then they'd have to let the suspicious car go while they took the time to seek a proper warrant from a judge. So cars are a prime example of how present day technologies really complicate our reading, understanding, and application of 18th century laws to our modern time. Plus, we can really see these complications when we look at car cases, because car cases provide us with a good glimpse of history's limitations when it comes to interpreting the law. Now, as Sarah mentioned, lawyers and judges like to have history on their side when they make a rule on an argument. Sometimes, they call history precedent. And their preference for having history a precedent on their side is really what prompted Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia to refer to the 1765 Entik case in 2012 and what prompted him to ask in 2008 whether a police officer would have been able to pull over and search Thomas Jefferson's carriage. Now, as Sarah noted, there is a problem with Justice Scalia's use of history and historical analogy in this 2008 case. Because realistically, Thomas Jefferson never would have been pulled over. And one of the reasons Jefferson wouldn't have been pulled over is that police officers and proactive policing techniques are really much more modern day developments. So, while history is a very important tool for interpreting and understanding American law, and while many lawyers, judges, and Supreme Court justices reference 18th century legal precedents in their arguments and decisions, history does have its limitations when it comes to interpreting the law. Still, despite these limitations, history is an important tool for the law. What history does is it allows us to better see how and why we have the laws that we have, and how and why interpretations of those laws have changed over time. Lawyers and judges then use all this historic information, along with their modern-day context, to make their arguments and decisions for why we should expand, refine, or decrease the powers and interpretations of certain laws. History and American law are really intertwined. They're closely connected because many American laws 
were created to prevent and solve past problems, actions, and abuses. For example, this Doing History series has really shown us that the Fourth Amendment came to be because the framers wanted to protect the American people from the unreasonable searches and seizures permitted by the general warrants of the British state. But how do we apply the framers' intended protection to our modern time? That's a question that has and will face every generation of Americans, as long as the United States Constitution of 1787 and all its amendments remain the supreme law of our nation. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States, then according to the rules of the common law. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Amendment 10. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This episode concludes our fourth Doing History series on understanding the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment. You can find more information about this Doing History series, Sarah Seo, and her book, Policing the Open Road, plus notes, links, and resources for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash two. Six, two. If you remain curious about the Constitution and its amendments, my Omahundro Institute Digital Projects teammates, Joseph Edelman and Holly White, have created some bonus materials for you. Joe has arranged for a special blog post, and Holly has prepared a list of all the books, articles, and resources that we use to think through and craft this series. Plus, Holly has also created a handy reference guide that lists all the definitions and legal terms that we talked about in this series. You'll find all these resources linked on the show notes page or in your Ben Franklin's World app. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, you've been asking for more information about the Constitution and how it works. So the Omahundro Institute's digital projects team and I created this series to answer some of your questions. But I don't imagine we've answered all of your questions. So what more would you like to know about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Tell me, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.